Good morning. Good morning. Philippians chapter 1 will not shy away from some of these subjects either, and so we're going to get into that, some of that. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, we preach down, I preach down through verse 11. So today, I'm going to read verses 12 through the end of the chapter, and then we're going to look and just highlight a, a, some of the passage that we're going to read today. Philippians chapter 1, I'm going to start and read for you, beginning in verse number 12. But I would, you should understand, brethren that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather into the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace 
and in other places. Many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose I know not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel." And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me, and now here to be in me. Our dear Heavenly Father, we ask now your blessing on the preaching of the word. Lord, an opportunity this morning to look through this book this precious book of Philippians. Lord, as Paul is writing to this church in Philippi, Lord, there are so many uh, applications we can draw, so many principles of such importance that we can draw. Lord, I pray that uh, we, we, we look at this not as, a, not as an ancient book written to an ancient church, but Lord, it's, a, it's a inspired by the Holy Spirit and pertinent for us today. Lord, there are so many parallels that we can draw uh, to this church in its beginning stages in the city of Philippi. Lord, things that we're battling, things we need to work on, things that are important, just as important in 2021 in Dillsburg, Pennsylvania, as it was in Philippi 2,000 years ago. Lord, anoint my lips to share that which you would have for us today. Lord, we ask all this in your precious name. Amen. In those first 11 verses last week, we looked at some of the, the marks or characteristics of a Christian and those things that should be in our lives. As we get to verses 12 through 19, and I'm going to go through the, the first part of this a little quicker. I'm going to spend the majority of my time on the back end of this chapter. But in verses 12 through 19, we see Paul talk about being a faithful witness and some of it faithful in spite of the circumstances. And so he talks about his bonds in verse number 13 and in verse number 14. And in spite of the, the persecution that he suffered, in spite of the conflict that he was under, we know from other passages, in spite of some of his personal problems, thorn in the flesh and all those things, he was to remain faithful. Faithful in preaching, faithful in ministering, faithful, as we saw in the first part of the chapter, in his concern and prayer and love for this church and the other churches that he had been so influential in helping to build. He talked about here uh, the, the, the importance of preaching Christ there. And he talks about some people doing it maybe from different perspectives or with different reasonings maybe even sometimes with different intentions. But the bottom line is, it was good to see Christ preach. And he saw that in verse 15 and in verse 16. Just the fact that the word of God is going out. The word of God is being preached. Maybe not the way Paul would have done it. Maybe not the way Paul intended it to be done in his 
in his, um, in his godly wisdom and godly experience that God had given him from his perspective. Maybe they weren't doing it the same way, but the word of God was being preached. People were getting saved. Their lives were being changed, and he was happy for that. We see the significance then of Christ in the life of the believer starting down in verse number 20. And in verse number 20, he talks about um, uh, the, the uh, emphasis of magnifying Christ. We see that in verse 20. So now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. And then in verse 21, familiar verse to all of us, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And so the emphasis was Jesus Christ. And the goal was Jesus Christ and him being glorified and him being magnified. So for Paul, we know this, he he said, even other passages, no matter what state I am, I've learned to be content. And so whether I'm going to be imprisoned or shipwrecked or whether I have the opportunity to stand and preach before you and see you again or whether it's me standing before the Roman council and before the Caesar and making a plea and making a, 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 a gospel presentation before those that are my captors and my accusers. No matter where I'm at, I want Christ to be glorified in that. And for me to live is, is Christ. It wasn't about Paul. It wasn't about him, his problems, his situation. Paul was never a woe is me Christian. He took the opportunity to magnify Christ. He took the opportunity to proclaim Christ. He wanted Christ to be the, the forefront of his entire life, his entire being. He talked about then his great dilemma. And I'm, I'm going to get back to this. I'm building up to this, and then we're going to get back to this. But verse 23, I'm in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So Paul's like, it, it would be great to just be with the Lord. That would be a, a, a my desire. You know, I... Uh, uh, the, the time in bonds, the time in prison, the, the, the scourgings, the shipwrecks, uh, the, the, the uh, conflict that he found himself in all the time. Paul's like, ultimately, it would be great to just be with the Lord. But the Lord has me here right now for a reason. And so I need to act upon that. I need to be faithful in that which he's given me to do. Now, keep that in mind as we build down through the rest of the chapter. He talks about his willingness to do whatever is the case. Verse 25 there, having this confidence, I know I shall abide and continue with you for what? For the furtherance and the joy of faith. That's his goal. That's, that's the job. That's what he's trying to do with the church at Philippi and other churches that he's writing to or has an opportunity maybe to speak at. He's looking at those as a, as a furtherance of the gospel and a building up of faith. And he talks about the importance of fellowship there in verse 26. Why that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Paul says, I see the advantage to that. He was able to help get this church started, get it going. He's away in prison right now. He's hoping for an opportunity to come back. He said, I think that would be important. I think it would be beneficial. I think the fellowship would be great. I think the benefit of having myself, Paul, back in the church, back with the people he had helped to start and, and make sure it's founded properly, make sure it's continuing on the course that it was founded upon, making sure all those things are in order, I think that would be prudent. I think that would be important. And so with all those things in mind, he gets down here to verse number 27, and this is really if you will, the emphasis of my message today. As I told you last week, when I'm preaching through, I want to highlight a few verses, and I'm highlighting down here verses 27 through the end of the chapter. So he says, because of all this, let your conversation or your walk, your example, your life, let it be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or be absent, whether or not I can come, that you stand fast. In one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Such an important verse and such a, a, a powerful verse. So much principle that we can take out of that. Striving together for the faith of the gospel. We, 
we buy uh, uh, many of our church supplies and uh, literature that we pass out from Striving Together uh, publications, your hymnals are uh, published by Striving Together out of um, uh, Lancaster Baptist Church in California. And they use this as their verse, as their core verse, Striving Together, Working Together, that big ministry trying to help smaller ministries that obviously we can't print our own hymnal. They have the opportunity to do that. So we're all striving together for the work of the gospel. Paul begins, though, with that phrase, stand fast. That's my desire for you. I need you to stand. So I preached a couple weeks ago. I preached on the subject of the rapture and that Jesus is coming again, and we should be ready for that. Um, I had uh, someone, I ran into someone yesterday, and they mentioned that they had watched that message. And I, I, I see on there, um, people are interested in that subject matter. Uh, whether they're um, maybe believers or not, whether they believe in the rapture or not, they are interested in the subject matter. And I say that because as soon as you put that in your title on YouTube, you get four or five times as many hits and likes and, and views, you know. And I don't go for that. I just noticed that. There's, you know, all my messages, 30, 32, 34 views. Oh, 140, you know. I preached on the rapture. So it gets, gets, gets people's attention, gets people interested in what you're talking about, gets people interested in what's next and what's what, uh, prophecy, Bible prophecy, and what the Lord has in store for us. But I talked to some of you uh, over the last couple of weeks about this, and I did even yesterday with the folks I ran into. And, and, and that's, that's this subject. And I, while the rapture is the next event, and while we are absolutely uh, commanded and expected to be looking for that. We're to be ready for that. We should not be caught off guard. We're looking for it and ready for it. Uh, the bottom line is, there may still be perilous days between now and then that we better also be ready for. Um, let's look at Paul's own thought process here in chapter 1. He says this, right? we've looked at this already, I have a desire to be there, but I have a job to do here. I'm in a straight betwixt too, because I would much rather leave this and go there. But I hope I can maybe come see you again, because I think that would be beneficial, and there are things we have to do now, and we better be standing fast now. And so I, I, I couldn't help but not see the parallel between Paul's heart and desire where he was and where so many of us may find ourselves today. I, we don't, listen to me, we don't have a, I, 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 I had this conversation with some unsaved people. I was in, I was in a, a course a number of years ago with a bunch of um, policemen. And uh, they were doing, we were doing some counseling training for first responders is what it was. And I was part of that. And I, I'm not going to get into all that. But they had a hard time being unbelievers, understanding a Christian's desire to be in heaven. Separating that from an unsaved person without hope wishing for death. As a Christian, those are polar opposites, right? But as an unbeliever, they got, that got murky for them. I'm like, well, a Christian wouldn't be scared of death. And a Christian knows that there's a, a place prepared for them. And there's a, a hope looking forward to that. That is vastly different than someone who is not a believer in God and has no faith in God, doesn't believe in eternal life one way or the other. That is vastly different than that person who has no hope and is looking at suicide as a way out of this life, right? To you and I, those, those don't even seem to merge. But to an unbeliever, 
they do. And Paul is looking at this saying, I'd rather be with the Lord. Not that Paul has any type of death wish. Paul is ultimately hoping he gets to go back to the church at Philippi and minister with them and fellowship with them and continue to teach them and keep them on the right track. But it doesn't, it doesn't take away from the fact that Paul's like, ultimately, wouldn't it be great to be with the Lord today? Wouldn't it be great to be with him? Wouldn't it be great when this life's work has ended and I cross the swelling tide and I'm looking forward to that time that I'm with the Lord? That is a goal that we have as Christians, but it doesn't take away from the work that is at hand today. In a similar way, you and I are looking forward to the trumpet sounding, Jesus Christ coming back in the clouds for you and I. And yet we dare not give up on today. One, there's work to do today. And two, like Paul was instructing the church at Philippi, we better be prepared to stand fast. Someone walked into church this morning and said to me, so do you think the world's a better place this week than it was last week? And we both laughed. No. No. The Bible talks about things waxing worse and worse. The Bible, um, there are, are many people around the globe this morning that are under intense persecution. And whether it's a, a renewed persecution like we've seen unfold tragically in Afghanistan, or an ongoing persecution as it has been in places like Vietnam, or North Korea, the communist regimes, whether it's an ongoing persecution in places that perhaps uh, are under um, strict Islamic rule and don't want Christianity. Boy, th a lot of those people, are, are, they, they meet in church with a real fear for their lives for going to church. I think we're at a point, and this is what I wrote in my notes today and kind of my, my key today. I, we expect there to be, we should expect there to be persecution before the Lord comes back. And I think a big part of the world around us is living it. And somehow maybe we have this idea in America that we're immune from it. Like, well, before anything gets bad here, Jesus will come back. As if he has a special clause just for America, you know? Which is not the case, you know? Is it possible, and I, this is what I wrote down, is it possible that, that, that persecution has already begun? I, I think it has. I think it's okay to say that. We're not, please understand, we are not anywhere near what Vietnam's going through or what North Korea is going through, or what communist China is going through, or not. But persecution doesn't come one day with someone holding a gun to your head making you make a decision for or against Christ. It comes in a trickle, right? It comes a little bit here and a little bit there. So that all of a sudden we're being told things that we say just don't comply. It's why I, I made a point of talking about YouTube a few minutes ago, and I know that what I'm saying now, we're going to upload to YouTube. But if YouTube doesn't like what I say, they remove it. And I take every YouTube video and share it on Facebook, and if Facebook doesn't like what I say, they remove it. And our little church in Dillsburg, Pennsylvania has had videos removed from Facebook, folks. They've, they don't like it. They don't like what we've said and they've removed it. I don't think I'm an overly uh, uh, contentious preacher arguing political things, but if they don't like it, if they don't like what the Bible says about gender, about the family, about marriage, they just remove it. 
And so we're seeing the word of God silenced today in, in methods that we use. And this is not something that we need to just read about on the internet that's happening in other places. It's happening everywhere, and it's happening to us too in small degrees. And it always starts in small degrees. So we need to be mindful of that. I, I, I would dare say that the things we see today are just the dripping of a faucet that may well become a running stream of a faucet not too long down the road. We've talked about this, and I'll, I'll probably talk about this more tonight, but how quickly have things changed in the last year and a half? So fast. I think about this, and I, this is, my, this is my, my little thing I do, my own weird little mind, all right? My, my father's been gone 22 years. And when I come up against things, I, I try to, like, imagine my dad came back today, and I have to explain to him how things have changed. And in, uh, I mean, the last year, how do I explain that to someone who hasn't seen it happen? The, the freedoms that are gone, the, the restrictions that are in place, the, the things that are happening to, to our country in general, and then to a degree, the church as well. We're seeing things change at a rapid pace and things... Listen, Paul told the church at Philippi, you need to stand fast. You're going to have to. Paul said, whether or not I'm able to come back, here's the message. Take a firm stand because it may be difficult. We know the church at Philippi was dealing with some degree of persecution in the time they were in against the idol worship that they were up against, within the Roman Empire that they were in. There's, Paul is about to lose his life over his stand, so we can imagine the government at the time and the, the, the implications of following Jesus Christ or proclaiming Jesus Christ. The person who wrote this died for their faith. And so we, we better be mindful of the fact that in 2021, we have to stand fast. It may not get easier. And I'm not a downer, but it's not going to get easier. It's going to get harder. It's going to get more difficult. I am hoping, and I wrote this down too, I am, I am really hoping and praying like many of us are for a, a great awakening in our country. I've stopped using the word revival. You can only revive what was once alive. And the majority of our country never been alive they don't know anything about God. They have no understanding of God. The churches need revived. Our country needs a great awakening. We need to awaken to the understanding of the sovereignty of God and his plan for the individual to make a decision, a personal decision for Jesus Christ, and then to walk in his commandments. That is gone. We just don't see that, so we need a great awakening. I'm hoping that happens. Listen, here's the bottom line. Do more people get saved when things are good or when things are bad? Unfortunately, people tend to be more open to the gospel, more open to looking for answers when things get difficult. In the good times, whether it's individually or as a nation, when things are gravy train, we just ride it out, right? Everything's wonderful. And when things start to get difficult, people start to look for answers. So this gives us an onus of responsibility and a goal moving forward. Ready? As things get worse and worse, before Jesus comes back, and we can't stop looking for that, we're expecting him to come back, but as things get worse and worse between now and then, we as believers in Jesus Christ need to be the ones that are standing firm. And as the rest of the world and maybe even fringe Christians, Christians in name only, Christians in when it's convenient only, as they begin to falter or panic or get upset or, or, or cringe or lose hope, we who are standing firm need to be able to say, the Bible has the answers. The Bible hasn't changed. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. We have a hope that's secure. We have a rock that's secure. We must stand. 
And so this is my goal as pastor of Cedar Hill Baptist Church. If and when things get worse, that we as a church don't crumble, that we stand firm. That we don't have, listen, that I don't have a congregation calling me saying, Pastor Wes, what are we going to do? But rather have a congregation that says, all right, here's an opportunity. This is not what we want. This is not what we are we're praying to get out of this. But in the midst of a problem, in the midst, in the midst of trouble, here's an opportunity for me to be a witness, for me to help others, for me to show Jesus Christ, for me to back what Paul said in verse number 20, that Christ may be magnified through me. That here's an opportunity for, for, for the, 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 the glory of Christ to be exclaimed and proclaimed to those who are searching and lost and without hope. Here's the opportunity to do that. We cannot be. We must stand fast. I wrote down, in spite of things that may be changing, whether it's our speech, whether it's being compliant, you know, compliant to things that are a problem. Again, we're going to look at this in Daniel's life tonight. I, well, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say this. I'm going to elaborate on it tonight. I think the church has been lulled into a sense of making health and safety a priority over everything else. Over everything else. We'll get to that tonight. We're to be striving together for the work of the Lord, our hand to the plow and not looking back. I think that's where we're at. I think that's the goal that we have. And so listen, listen, I, I don't want to preach a message that makes us leave here discouraged, but we do need to preach a message of reality. And the reality is the days are getting worse and worse. We are to expect persecution. We're to expect that. And we are to stand fast no matter what comes our way. I know many of you, and we've talked about this over the last year, we wanted, this was the word we used and we kind of stuck with it. We wanted our hour of service on Sunday morning to be an hour of normalcy in the midst of a crazy world. And we, I think we did that pretty well. We did that safely. We did that uh, consistently. I think we did pretty well with that. So in this hour that we have, not every message is going to be, um, woohoo, glad God's on my side, you know. Some messages are going to have to be, we got to buckle down. We have to make sure we're ready. If things get tougher or things get more difficult in the world around us, we can't be the ones that shake and shiver and moan and groan. We have to be the ones that have an answer that is secure, that is grounded in the word of God. We have to be willing to take a stand. Daniel did that all by himself. We have a church body and a community of believers that we should be able to rally around and stand firm even when things get difficult. Let's pray. Our dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we've had today. Lord, preached a message a little different, but Lord, this church in Philippi, Lord, Paul was commissioning that church and prodding that church to stand firm whether or not he could come and help them or whether or not he was able to visit and fellowship again, whether or not he was able to continue teaching them, they needed to stand fast for perilous times were at hand. Lord, Paul said that and then soon thereafter lost his own life as a martyr. Lord, are we willing to take a stand? Are we willing to be that Daniel who is willing to stand in the face of, of intense scrutiny, questioning, even persecution. Lord, I pray that we, we buckle down, that we get into the word, that, that we're grounded, that our anchor is secure. And if that storm of life, if that hurricane of life 
hits our little vessel where we are, we're not suddenly adrift, but we are grounded to something that doesn't move, that being the Word of God. Lord, I thank you for this time. Thank you for these dear folks. Lord, continue to work in our hearts and minds as we, as we live for you. Lord, if there's one here today that doesn't know you as Savior, Lord, I'm not sure today's message was geared towards that as much as encouraging the Christian to be a committed Christian. But Lord, if there's one here today that doesn't know you as Savior, Lord, I pray today would be their day of salvation. Lord, I pray they don't leave here today without stopping me and saying, Pastor Wes, I want to know what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We'd be honored to take the word of God and show them verse by verse what it means to put faith and trust in Christ alone. Lord, we thank you for this time. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen. 617 is our last song, and it is, Will Jesus Find Us?